Hey, photographers, welcome to the Boca Podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm here to help you build a sustainable photography business. That means improving your photo skills, building on your business knowledge, and honing your marketing abilities. But it also means helping you work more efficiently so you don't get burnt out in the long run. We do try to bring the show to you commercial free, so make sure to check out our sponsors, photographersedit.com and milu, M-I-I-L-U.com. Photographers Edit is custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and milu is the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing. Again, photographersedit.com and milu.com. All right, let's get into today's episode. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're back for another Boca podcast episode. And we have brand new guests on the show today, Sayori and Devante Terrell. Thank you so much for hanging out with me, um, for conversation, to share your work and to share what's on your mind as well. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Thank you. We're so excited. Well, and and I am as well. And I know that might sound like a kind of a cliche thing to say uh, from a podcast host, but I, I mentioned to you before we started recording, I'm looking at your Instagram account and it's just, it's so warm and inviting. And I just want to kind of spend time looking through it in a way that I, I don't always experience look at, at looking at photographers account. So major props to you for just really beautiful work. Thank you so much. We uh, try to really emphasize that warmth, that, um, you know, that love and, and admiration for like human connection, because that's like what drives us. So we try to really emphasize that in, you know, what we display. And we don't have that, that we don't have like that long of a feed, but um, what we do, we try to be very intentional about like what we post and, and for that reason to, you know, to kind of give off that feeling. So it means a lot. Thank you. 100%. And and for everybody listening in, I have to make sure I mention it's that the Instagram account is Spirit of Revelry, just like it sounds. Um, and we'll put that in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. Also, go ahead and mention the website as well as Spirit of Revelry. Dot com And again, we'll put that in the show notes, bocapodcast.com. For everybody listening in, actually, if you don't take advantage of the show notes, just know Haley, who produces the show, is putting links to the resources we discuss as well as the talking points from the show in the show notes, bocapodcast.com, or you can find them in your podcast player as well. But Sarah and, and Devante, we're going to actually, let's, let's talk about photography, your photography business. First of all, give our listeners a little bit of context. Whereabouts are you based? Um, Houston, Texas. Yes. Okay, cool. And how long have you been working in that market there? Um, so I started a little bit before Devante did. I've been shooting actually since 2010. So late 2010. So like 10 ish years and everything. And so I started actually taking it a little bit more seriously. Um, in I want to say 2012, it was more so like a hobby for me in the beginning, more creative personal work and everything. And so, uh, Devante, you can talk about you. <laughs> yes, uh, I started in uh, 2017. Uh, it was just mostly like landscapes, uh, some couple shoots, some uh, portraits. Portrait. It was mostly a hobby for myself, but uh, we actually just got married earlier this year, January 11th. Yeah, we decided to consolidate our businesses. You know, we had like minds and we created Spirit of Revelry. We that, had to like rebrand and kind of revamp everything and kind of join forces. And, and that was because it was something we had in common, all of that. Um, our, our aspirations in life and, you know, kind of the lifestyle we wanted to live. We, we were very um, in sync in, in terms of that. So so that's kind of, it was our love child. Well, and, and first of all, congratulations to you, um, not only in your, your marriage, but also in, in the creation of this kind of new joint venture. I have to ask you, though, because I used to photograph with my partner, shot weddings for about 10 years or so together, and we, it would get a little bit competitive. Like one of the things that we would do, and I know I, I think I've mentioned this in the podcast before, but we would we actually began internally in the camera naming our files differently so that when we were looking at the pictures after we'd shoot a wedding... Um, we could actually, we would know whose pictures were which. Because if we got to a picture and we're like, oh man, that looks awesome. And then we didn't know whose it was and we couldn't take credit for it. Uh, that was a little bit of a bummer. So we would we began naming um, our, our own files differently just so we could, we knew who got what. Do y'all have a competitive edge too? Uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny that you mentioned that. I, I think we're pretty, um, we're pretty like on par with like, you know, with all of that. But our thing is more so we just, 
we get on each other's nerves a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> we have to remember to like, you know, okay, calm down. You know, we're yeah, you, like, yeah, we're business partners, but you know, I still love you and, and everything. But in terms of like all of that, I think we, we typically don't care. And I can, we, I think we're both pretty good at like telling who's who. Right. Um, so she's significantly better than I am. <laughs> <laughs> she's taught me just about everything I know as far as uh, editing and, shooting style her eye is amazing and thank you i will i will say she she's my teacher <laughs> wow that's it okay so the, the high compliments i know um, i i'm blushing <laughs> uh, that's that's really cool okay do, do you each have a particular style that's a little bit different or like if you're shooting weddings for example or is, is one person focusing on one area of the wedding while the other is focusing on their specialty what does that look like um yeah so t- typically we kind of split up the timeline and we every wedding is different and so together we've done a couple uh, we've done a few and so what we do is just depending on what the coverage amount is we are able to um I, I'm I'm a little bit better with the group shots and you know all of the organizing wrangling people and stuff and so he's really good at like detail so it, it's more so like a maybe like a personality thing mm-hmm. um, where I'm really I'm, I'm more social and, and animated and able to like be fast and not that you're slow <laughs> 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 but it's more um, he's a little bit more patient and more calm and, and with with his shooting and so details and like ceremony stuff is like really really good for him and like. Um, same thing with like reception, uh, you know, during the reception, just kind of being like a fly on the wall. But I'm, I'm more like in the business, if that makes sense, like more in the action and stuff. So we kind of just we it, it, we're just such a good team in, in every aspect of our lives together. And so we kind of just naturally just kind of gravitate toward what, you know, we thrive into and we're able to observe that. And we kind of like balance each other out, if that makes sense. Um, I know it sounds super corny. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's kind of how, um, you know, we use that to our advantage for that reason, because we just pick up where the other one, you know, kind of leaves off. And so, so yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I, I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive. And I, I can see too, how playing to your personality strengths, I mean, that just makes sense. Things do flow so much better that way. I also have to just, this is a random recommendation. Um, but if, if y'all like to read, there's a book called Mating in Captivity, Mm -hmm. Um, being newlyweds that you might find really interesting. Esther Perel is an author. Are you familiar with her? Yes. We're obsessed with her. Oh, no way. Yeah. We're, um, we've read, I want to say we're like an hour and a half in. It's not that much, but, um, we've been, it's been a crazy couple of weeks. And so, um, we have it on our audible, um, account. And so every time we're in the car, we're listening a little bit here and there. And yeah. so we're obsessed with her. And like, I've seen every single Ted talk, every single, you know, live speaking event that she's ever done. I'm obsessed with her. <laughs> well, it, okay. So if you like that, we'll, we'll take a deep dive here. She not only has two or three books out, but, and then as you mentioned the Ted talks, um, she also has, have you listened to her podcast? I have to get on that. Um, I know that she has it. And like I said, we're just all over the place sometimes, but I am going to get on that immediately just because I'm like, I'm, I, I love her the way she speaks, everything she says, it's like mind blowing just to, I could listen to her talk all day long. So. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, and just to give everybody listening in some context, I know I've mentioned Esther before in the podcast, but for those of you who are not familiar with her, she is a, a therapist and um, this book mating in captivity, if if I'm to simplify it, it very simply focuses on how to create the tension that will lead to passion in a long-term relationship. Um, and, and actually, more specifically, she talks about the root of passion, which is tension, tension in a positive way, and talks about how couples might go about creating that tension that continues to you know, push them back to each other over a long-term relationship. And it's a, just such fascinating perspective. Her podcast, um, she actually records, of course, with the client's permission, at live therapy sessions. And oh my word, it's it, it's so enlightening at times and, and fascinating, again, to listen to her perspective. So highly recommended. We'll find all that stuff and link to it in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. But let's jump back to photography. And, <laughs> and I actually want to ask you, so with your experience in photography now and having a business there in the Houston area, how would you sum up, especially with this kind of updated brand, Spirit of Revelry and the two of you photographing together, how would you sum up your brand position there in the Houston market? 
Um, awesome. So, um, you know, we're all, like I said, we're all about like the art of human connection and, and the spirit of like celebration. Um, and, and what we do is we try to make that the focal point and Houston is a very diverse city. So we are pretty good with like, we're, we're blessed. We're lucky to be, ha- to have that wide variety of like, um, couples and all kinds of love stories. And so that's, that's basically what we're all about. We love love and we're firm believers of intersectional inclusion. And, um, from the beginning, we were on a mission to promote diversity and to eradicate like the influence of prejudice and everything in the industry. So the market that we're in really, really helps with that. Wow. Okay. So, and I'm actually on the homepage of your site, spiritofrevelry.com for everybody listening in. Um, I scroll down just a little bit and there's a little, shall we call it a position statement of traveling wedding photographers for the wild drunken love. But then you elaborate on that a little bit and I'll just read this uh, to give everybody a feel for the brand. Bohemian souls, free spirits, wanderlust and vagabonds, We're here for those who have zero fucks left to give, who aren't interested in cookie cutter bullshit. You're not going to find that here. This is for those genuine badass lovers, the rebellious at heart who refuse to conform. I I think everybody listening in is beginning to understand a little bit of the edge that comes with the brand, which is really, really cool too. Uh, But then the significance of inclusion, I I love that, that that's a theme. And of course, ultimately what we're going to get into discussion about later on in the podcast today from your experience, though, as business owners, what would you say is the most important principle behind providing a wonderful customer experience? And Devante, I'd love to hear your thought on this, too. Oh, yes, absolutely. So uh, for us, it's all about establishing a, a genuine connection from the beginning. You know, from the moment the couples inquire to the day that they receive their gallery, we want them to feel like a priority, you know. Uh, it's more than just pretty photos. We want to cultivate a strong and thriving friendship. Yeah. And- also, you know, we want to document their love story in the most artistic way possible. So. Wow. Okay. So now I know that this is this idea of creating genuine relationships, developing relationships with our clients. This has become more popular over the last number of years. Uh, and by the way, I will say it's in stark contrast to what the industry was like when I first started back in 2001, I guess it was where, you know, it was very much the kind of the old school professional and its business and the formality of business, Uh, such stark contrast now, which is wonderful, I think. But at the same time, it's easy for a lot of photographers to talk about that. In fact, you hear a lot of photographers talk about it. They talk about it here on the podcast, even. It's another thing to actually do something about it and to follow through on it and to actually create genuine relationships. Because, I mean, the reality is, as human beings juggling multiple relationships, particularly close relationships can be a little bit difficult. So Devante, what is it? What does that look like practically when, when you're sitting down with that client for the first time, or maybe photographing them for the first time? How are you encouraging that relationship? I mean, honestly, we're just, you know, being real. Um, okay. I want whenever we step in front of the camera to be like, you're just hanging out with old friends. I want it to be as unawkward as possible. Yes. Um, you know, a lot of people have a problem with that. Uh, a lot of these shoots that we've been doing lately, um, we do a lot of style shoots with other photographers and they don't tend to have that knack for, you know, making the the model or the subject feel unawkward. Mm. You know, it's, it's, they don't need to feel any more awkward than the situation already is. I mean, you're, you're getting married. It's, it's a beautiful day. Don't stretch yourself out. I, I think that the thing is um, treating them like the people that they are. And, and the people that we try to connect with are people who, like we said in that bio, like, you know, that have no fucks left to give, like that are okay with breaking tradition and everything. And, and the way that we try to cultivate that authenticity is by getting to know them and, and talking about, you know, we'll text before, um, you know, we ever meet and, and, and chat. Yeah. Go for drinks. We love karaoke. And so we've invited several couples out and, and it's been a great time and um, texting, sending each other memes and just, it, it's just, we try to connect with people that are, like us and, and that um, that we can learn from also. We just get so inspired by um, the people that we get to work with and stuff. And so we make sure to let them know that like we are super all about the wedding, yes, but also beyond that, the marriage and, and the relationship and get to know their stories and everything. And so we kind of like, that's kind of how it blossoms. It's just getting to know each other. And and especially because we'll, we spend so much time with the bride and the groom or, or the grooms and, and, and um, on the day. Um, so we try to make sure that we get along well because, you know, we're going to be spending so much time together. So, so yeah, we just try to 
like like you said, just kind of be old friends by the time that we get to hang out and, and shoot together. So, what I actually want to highlight something Devante said, which really struck a chord with me because I know I've been guilty of not doing this in the past. But Devante, when you said that you're just yourself, um, again, that that might kind of seem cliche, and a lot of photographers you you hear that. In fact, in just in culture these days, you know, just be you. But when I, when I think about it from a practical perspective as a business owner, and especially as a photographer, if I'm going to a shoot and I'm trying to put on some face or some show uh, in order to create an experience or whatever the, the motivation might be, I'm naturally going to be stiffer, right? It, it, I'm not going to be as relaxed as if I am just the same person that I am any other part of my life with those clients. Um, and obviously, there's a certain amount of professionalism that will include in that effort. But I, if, if we're stiff, they're going to be stiff. If we're relaxed, they're going to be relaxed. And that's, that's really what kind of, I guess I was thinking through Devante, as you were talking about that, and that really resonates with me. I think that's really important for all of our listeners to, well, ultimately to, to pay attention to and actually apply to what you're doing. If you show up relaxed, the client's going to be more relaxed. It makes for much easier, um, not only photographic session, but then also exactly what Sarah was talking about, which is the relationship that's created over time is so much stronger and their experience is much better as a result. So I, I love um, both your thoughts on this. And let me just go ahead and jump to the next question, though, because we have so much to talk about time, um, especially as newlyweds. It's it's the difficult thing, right, to juggle personal life and business life. I'm curious what your perspective is on how to create time Again, not just for business, but also for your personal lives. Have you found right. a particular tip or technique that helps in that balance? I'd say investing in a gravity blanket, honestly. <laughs> um, those weighted blankets like will change your life. <laughs> but in all seriousness, like we have to be really conscious about like putting our phones down and having real face to face time with not only each other, but our families. Uh, you know, we're married and in business together. So we have to continue courting each other, yeah. dating, all of that fun stuff. Kind of like what you were mentioning uh, that Esther talks about in that book. And that's yep. kind of uh, our motivation for reading it while we've had this downtime. So we want to be sure to set boundaries with work and um, not, you know, we, we want to avoid being workaholics, um, even though we love what we do. And the best way that we can do this is to like actually intentionally set some kind of structure to our work week and schedule in like a Disney plus and chill day kind of thing. So we have to like be very um, intentional about it and, and make that space. And, and so, yeah, so we kind of, yeah. Okay. So I, but I want to get back to the weighted blanket. It, it is important to, to create that <laughs> dedicated time, but that was a really funny little um, comment. I, I'm curious, is there, okay. Number one, is there a particular weight that you prefer? And then is this something that you all would both sit in un underneath together or is it like one at a time situation? Like how do you use the weighted blanket? Well, uh, the weight that we have right now is uh, 35 pounds. Whoa. That's so good. <laughs> I can't tell you. I, it, it was the best buy we ever had. I, <laughs> it's like a king size blanket. It, it's huge and it's so heavy. You can barely lift it. But <laughs> when you're sleeping in it, it feels like a hug. Like, <laughs> You can't get up. Every time I lay down with my wife, she gets so mad because I'm probably going to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, a, I, I, I tell them I can't trust him in the blanket alone just because he has a <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. But I'm really curious about this because I have, I, I got a 15, actually, I think I've tried it twice now. I got two different blankets that I think were both 15 pounds. The one may have been 20 and it was, it was relatively comforting, but ultimately hot. And so I stopped using them, but I'm wondering if maybe I didn't go extreme enough. Maybe I need to go like a heavier blanket and I'll just, that'll, that'll solve all my problems. <laughs> I mean, the way to co counteract that is to have your AC set really low. It's like an ice chest in our house, in our apartment. Um, we keep it super cold. And on top of that, I love sleeping with the fan directly on us. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> so that helps. That's really interesting. Okay. I, I may have to actually give this an, a shot one more time because I, I was like, you know, I, I it seems like it would be relaxing and comforting and help me sleep a little bit better, but um, I just hadn't had quite the luck with it. I might have to try the heavier blanket. All right. All the things that we learn on the Boca podcast. Um, let me actually keep going though. Let's talk about just briefly talk about delegation and outsourcing. So, you know, time management, obviously one of the most important ways that we can save time as business owners is delegation, whether it's email management or album design or editing or accounting or whatever it might be. Is this something that you all have experimented with uh, and had any positive experience with? 
Well, actually, uh, as of right now, we don't really delegate anything. I mean, other than the uh, the branding and our logos, that was made by uh, one of our friends. Um, yeah. But uh, other than that, we pretty much take care of everything else ourselves. Uh, uh, Sayori actually made our website from scratch. So we try to be, uh, I think, like, depending on, I guess, the growth of the business, that would be, that is something we are definitely looking and, and will consider um, for, like, yeah, for future endeavors and everything. And, and uh, just, w- I kind of tend to be like a tight, like, control freak. <laughs> <laughs> so I like having, like, a, like, a, it's just part of my anal personality, I guess. <laughs> no, I you but, know I get it though because I, I think a lot, if not most, photographers are that way. So, and, and I can relate to the idea. It can be really tough to to give something up when you feel like right. if you give that thing up, then it's not going to be handled the same way. And then, how's that going to affect my business? Right. Um, that can be a lot to process. Right, absolutely. But I, I guess depending on the growth of the business um, and and where it goes from here, just because we have so many projects in mind and so many things that we want to do, um, depending on how it goes, like we, I'm definitely okay with giving up, like um, or, or I guess outsourcing like the um, social media and uh, email stuff, uh, so yeah. we can do more like, in real life uh, work. If that makes sense. Yeah, the you stuff know? the stuff or, that actually yeah. requires your presence. That, right, right. That's so much more valuable if you can allocate your time to that. So that, that's yeah. that's really great. And I hope you're able to find some good resources for that. Um, talk Absolutely. to me about inspiration. Um, and I mean, we and it's kind of a like it's a typical 2020 American thing to talk about in, being inspired by something, especially in the photography industry. But it's really easy for us to get sucked into the photography industry specifically and our friends, you know, photographer friends feeds and and not really think outside that relatively little box. Do you find inspiration outside of the photography industry somewhere that helps make you a better photographer and business owner? Absolutely. I mean, we find inspiration in the magic of everyday life. You know what I'm saying? It can be anything from an old grainy TV sitcom or, you know, something from an avant-garde expedition at a art gallery. Yeah. Uh, even live music, the open road, an old book, a poetry, uh, a few good beers with our closest friends. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's so it's a, much. It's about the feeling of the moment and that emotion, that drive is kind of, uh, the good vibrations is what kind of inspire us, inspires us. And I know that something we had in common from the beginning was that um, we didn't want to um, I guess have our main source of photography be photography. We wanted to have other, uh, in order to be more original, I guess, or more unique in, in a way. We wanted to make sure that we were expand expanding our um, horizons in terms of like art, the, you know, the the culture, um, everything that we could um, possibly derive some kind of inspiration from you know just the expressions of the soul through music and and all kinds of music at that so all of that kind of ties into the way that we want our work to look and to feel if that makes sense oh yeah it absolutely does you know i think about um a a young child's curiosity and how there's a tendency a lot of kids like just kind of soak things in and get super (laughs) excited about everything um and and that that's what I guess I'm reminded of when I hear you talking about finding passion in everything. And and I think it, 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 again, as cliche as it sounds, I think there is something really significant to that. I know that I personally enjoy life way more as I remain curious. And, you know, I see people around me who've kind of gotten numb to this aspect of life or that aspect of life. And um, I feel like they're missing out in some ways, you know, there's there, we can really learn to appreciate the little things that are going around, going on all around us and let that excitement, that passion then translate to what we're doing as photographers and business owners. I, I think that's a really great reminder. One of our like mantras and something that we really love to uh, focus on is this quote um, that says that the greatest secrets are always hidden in the most unlikely places. And mm. uh, it goes on to say that the, those who, those who believe in ma- those who don't believe in magic will never find it. So right. it's all about being open to finding that wonder and that mystery and that that excitement literally everywhere you go. And so yeah, I just wanted to kind of second what you were saying. Yeah, what well, and sometimes literally just right in front of you, right? I mean, that's that's such a good reminder. Talk to me about education though. We have inspiration and education, the education making us, you know, I guess practically and and more intelligent business owners, uh, photographers, more talented photographers. Is there been a source of, of education, maybe a specific book um, that has been really helpful in your life or in your business in recent years? 
Uh, well, recently it's been a uh, "You Are a Badass at Making Money" by Jen Sincero. Okay, a really good book, by the way. I highly recommend it. Uh, you know, we're really spiritual and we obsess over self help books. So, you know, same. I feel like I want to really make an impact. And um, so it's not so much like business education, but it's kind of like where we derive like our confidence and motivation when it comes like to all areas of our lives, including business. So it kind of has like a trickle effect on. Um, you know, on all of that, there's another one called Think and Grow Rich, yes. uh, of the Millionaire Mind. And yeah. it's not so much about like, you know, raking in the cash or anything like that. It's more so about the, the mindset, the mindset, yeah, of, of knowing that we are capable of, you know, doing anything and finding a way to, um, you know, just to make shit happen and, and, and be open to all kinds of possibilities. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of like where we derive most of our inspiration for um, expanding on all of that. You know, that's, I, I think that's really interesting. I mean, the, the reality is there's a lot of information out there that we can derive on a, like a very practical level, you know, learn how to do, to, to manage our finances, for example, or learn how to uh, take a more creative image by using particular lighting or whatever the technical thing might be. But I, I very much feel you and, and the, the inspiration that comes from learning just basic life principles from books like You're a Badass at Making Money. I haven't personally read that book, but there are countless people that have recommended that book here on the podcast. Um, and we'll certainly put it in the show notes. But I, I really think there is something to that. In fact, there are actually, in fact, if you all like self help books, um, here at the show, uh, Haley, who produces the show, she's actually put together something called the Boca Bookshelf. So for everybody listening in, if you go to Boca, B O K E H, bookshelf.com, um, there is a collection of what have been the most popular books here in you know, 400 plus episodes on the podcast. Uh, make sure you go take advantage of that because there's there's some good recommendations there. Absolutely. Sounds perfect. We'd love to check that out and, and can't wait to dive into all of that. We're huge book nerds. So. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. and I'm, I'm curious too to hear what you end up thinking about uh, Esther's book, Mating in Captivity. You have to let me know what you think. Yeah. But Oh, yeah. We're going to, you know, speaking of important conversations and things that we need to learn, um, I was recently, in fact, I was scanning some of the industry news, the photography industry news, and I came across an article that HoneyBook had posted. And this is actually how I found out about you guys. Um, an article that you all wrote called How to Dismantle Racism in the Photography Industry. And it was quite a, a compelling article. And I thought, you know what, how, I guess, apropos really to have you all on the podcast to discuss what um, you brought to light in that article, certainly, um, would love to get your thoughts on it. And, and maybe just to give a little bit of context too, how, what's your connection to HoneyBook and how did you get the opportunity to write this article for them? Um, so we are, I guess, clients of HoneyBook. And so we use their um, system for, for our client relations and everything. And so it's been a huge staple and a huge help in our workflow and everything. But um, so the way we got, I guess, the opportunity to write that article came as a result of a video that we posted. Um, mm. So we like posted an IGTV video where we basically were calling out the photography industry and its perpetuation of racism and prejudice. Mm. And so basically we were frustrated by how many creatives were choosing to silence themselves as opposed to speaking up and using their platforms. So that, um, so basically we, that inspired us to make, a pretty shitty pixelated video <laughs> in hopes that someone would listen. And so uh, we just wanted to give our thoughts on actionable steps for people to, to, to employ and to do other than just posting a black square. It was, it was that day of the uh, blackout Tuesday. Yeah. And yep. so we saw, I don't know how many just, just blank black squares. And we were frustrated that people, it seemed to be that the notion was, you know, you post it and, and you show that you're about it and you show that you care and that's it. And and you get to wipe your hands clean and, and you know, resume business as usual. But we were like, no, like I, I felt like it, it was like a very, um, what's the word? I wouldn't say cataclysmic, but it was like a very, it, it was a key point I guess in all of our journeys where we, all of our attentions seem to be on this uh, topic. Um, and so we felt like it was the perfect moment to expand and let everyone know that there's more that you can do yeah. outside of just posting a black square with a hashtag. Well, and just to give further context, of course, to the conversation for anybody who might be listening to this episode in the distant future, um, the last three weeks, we've been kind of reeling from the death of George Floyd and, and all that's followed and obviously, the, our, our culture is deep in conversation 
about the significance of racism and the role that it still plays in our culture, which again, is just kind of mind blowing to me, especially, I mean, 2020, and I said this to you all before we got started, but it just, it's such a weird concept to me that this is still a conversation that sadly needs to be had despite all of our other progress and technology um, that we're still needing to address this issue. It's, it's, it, it's just a, it's a tragedy really. And, um, and, it, but ultimately a couple of things, First of all, the, the article, and, and I really appreciate you all taking time to write that article and putting it out there for everyone to read. And of course, we'll link to it in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. It's on the HoneyBook um, community site. And then we'll also we'll link to or embed, if it's all, all right with you all, the, the IGTV video um, that, that you posted and and it was it's along the same lines and and just very raw and and really good actually you know because you you mentioned the the black squares all the black squares that were being posted um without really any kind of context anything said um and and I will say as just an average white guy that you know part of my struggle um even when I posted that uh a number of number of things kind of came to mind but one of those certainly was just wanting to make sure I didn't say the wrong thing um mm-hmm. I knew that that my actions in the industry demonstrated active support of the black community of photographers of color. But in that particular moment, it was like, ah, oh, you know, how, if, if I've say this thing, it could be misconstrued this way, or somebody can criticize it that way. It was tough to know what to say. So to that point, I love that you all give context uh, and further food for thought to the conversation by posting that video. And I think that's really helpful. And for anybody who's listening in, who's not seen that yet, again, we'll link to that so that you can take a look. I think it's really important. Absolutely. Thank you. A hundred percent. Well, and, and, you know, I, I mentioned George Floyd and uh, obviously that's what started this conversation about three weeks ago. There's been so much that's gone on since then. And, and we could easily spend hours and hours kind of breaking it all down. But one of the questions that I think is important to ask just really is what have been the overwhelming, I guess, themes of thoughts and feelings that have been going through your mind since that time? Well, uh, first of all, I would like to say uh, rest in peace to uh, George Floyd. Uh, Our condolences go out to his family. Um, But uh, these thoughts and feelings that we're, we're having didn't just appear, you know, last week or a few weeks ago uh, upon the death of George Floyd, Fair. you know, there have been so many before him and even our own experiences as black and brown people in this country give us plenty to think about, you know, mm. am I going to be next? You know, I'm a six foot three, 250 pound black man. So with tattoos and a beard. So, you know, I'm seen as a threat, you know, as a danger to be avoided an intimidating, scary person, you know, we get these biases placed on us uh, from society, you know, it's ingrained in us uh, since childhood. Yeah. But, uh, you know, little do they know I'm a giant teddy bear, you know, <laughs> I love my gravity blanket and I love me some cartoons. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I think, and I was actually, I was chatting with my friend uh, Chip Desard on, on a previous podcast episode. And one of the things that I, that I mentioned was the word assumptions. Um, you know, at, at the root of, of racism and, and in fact, all kinds of relational issues is this word assumption. Uh, you point out, Devante, that you look a particular way, people make assumptions based on the way that you look, and the reality is in stark contrast to those assumptions being made. Can you all speak to that idea of assumptions and how that plays into this conversation about racism? I think um, these assumptions are kind of ingrained in us, like Devante was saying, since childhood. Um, you know, our experiences, you know, we were born into the skin. And so um, we've all had, um, you know, our own share of, um, yeah, of experiences since elementary school. Um, you know, and, and so the assumptions are unfair and, and we have to learn um, about them because we're on the receiving end of that. And so it's just something that we grew up having uh, in mind that other children never had to worry about uh, something that they never had to learn something that we're going to have to teach our children also um, whenever, if we ever decide to have kids um, just because I'm personally terrified of of bringing a child into this world right Mm. now. Um, But something that many black mothers um, have to, you know, think about is, is those assumptions and to inform their children, people are going to see you as 
a threat, you know, don't, you know, don't act in a way that's going to make other people uncomfortable. Um, you know, don't get killed by police. Here's how you don't do that. Um, and, and, and so it's just, I, I can't even, it's hard to even kind of formulate a, a specific thought without getting emotional just because it's so much that as little children from the beginning, we have to learn and we have to understand that we are on the receiving end of these assumptions. Um, my, my maiden name is Hernandez. And so that tells people that I'm on the wrong side of the border. It, 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 we've had, I can't tell you how many times we've had, um, or that I've had an experience with uh, people being like passively aggressive or being like, you know, kind of insinuating things that, you know, outside in the political world where, um, you know, it's, we're painted as like, should I say it, uh, bad hombres and, 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 you know, criminals and thugs. And, and so it's just all of these ideas that are circulating outside just in the mainstream media that without even realizing they kind of stick to people and they kind of become part of their own biases and part of their own beliefs. That's why without really knowing why people like women will clutch their purse whenever they walk by Devante or they kind of swerve to avoid him. It's, it's not so, it's not, I, I guess it's, Sorry, I'm getting flustered just because it's so emotional for us. But um, it, it's uh, it's part of those assumptions that we automatically, I guess, they automatically stick to people's subconscious just because of the way that we're portrayed hmm. uh, all the time. And so, so yeah, it's a it's a dangerous thing to have these assumptions and these biases because it leads to horrific you know, yeah, events such, such as, as, yeah, the, the death of George Floyd. And like we said, it's not just him. It's been so many for so long. And, and, and only now is it becoming more, uh, I guess, maybe visible because of social media and, and, and because there is a lot more, there are many more ways to kind of publicize and, and, and show this to people who are otherwise blind to it, if that makes sense. So yeah, sorry, I think I went off on a tangent there, but I hope that made sense. Not at all. No, I mean, ultimately, this is very much meant to be a conversation. And I love that you all are just kind of sharing what, what you're thinking, what's on your mind, what's on your heart. Um, and, and speaking of, actually, there was a post that you made not very long after that video um, that I just want to read out loud. And, and you know, I, th I think a lot of these conversations, at least from my perspective as a white person, is about perspective. I want to gain more perspective. I want my fellow white photographers to gain more perspective. I think it's important. And perspective can help change the way that or, or ultimately minimize the assumptions, right? If we gain perspective, if we have more information, there's no reason for assumption. Anyway, to that point, um, your post uh, recently, it said, and this is from uh, what's a week ago, so I guess June 10th on Instagram, but it said, it is not okay to just post a photo of a black person and throw in a political or BLM caption with it, especially if they didn't agree or weren't aware of your intentions. Our existence is not a trend. Here are some things to consider as you diversify your feed. Tag and share with your industry friends who may find it useful. And by the way, this is a video as well. So for everybody listening in, we'll also link to that in the show notes. But can you just share your thoughts on, on that post and what that meant? Um, yeah, I mean, but honestly, it, it's kind of hard to kind of expand without, like I said, getting into that emotional place. But, you know, my initial reaction is, you know, what more can we elaborate on? You know, like Fair. it's tokenism plain and simple, you know, you can't just pick your one black client and make them the poster boy for your inclusivity statement to mm. make yourself look good. You know, we've had a lot of uh, people uh, that have been very honest and transparent that uh, have reached out mm. and have told us that, you know, in their 10 plus years of shooting, they've only had three, four or five black clients. Mm. They don't know how to talk to people, um, you know, to BIPOC folks without making them feel offended. And so, you know, you, you can't just start all of a sudden you know, start posting pictures of black folks and call yourself non-racist or diverse when your entire feed was whitewashed before all this shit hit the fan. You know, you kind of have to do the inner work to become anti-racist and people, you know, sadly are starting to go back to their usual posts talking about their lattes and yoga pants and everything. So this seems to have been clearly a trend for them while the topic was hot. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what we want to try to avoid because we don't get to forget about our experience as black and brown folks. We don't get to just all of a sudden, you know, ah, go back to normal. That's dangerous for us. And the, mm -hmm. the, the reason for having these conversations and, and posting things like this um, across the board, not just us here, but you know, we've seen so many creatives uh, continue and, and try to keep those conversations open um, because they're, 
there has to be that understanding that it is dangerous for us to go back to normal, how things were before. And, and it's important to continue to expand and to, to learn and unlearn. And I guess, like you were saying, to kind of clarify um, and correct those assumptions that we tend to have from the get go. And so, so yeah, that's kind of at the heart of it all. Well, and yeah, I have to say too, even again, as a white person, I, I was, I was really put off, frankly, by the, as you, you said, the tokenism or the virtue signaling that we saw um, that became a trend, sadly, um, for a very short time. But in some ways, it was kind of a relief because, as you said as well, that, you know, all these posts that wouldn't have been the norm for this individual, suddenly they're posting something and uh, virtue signaling is the best phrase I can I can think of here, you know, posting something to kind of fit the conversation at hand. Um, right. we, we need to go beyond one convenient post. We need to take action. And we're going to be talking about taking action here, what that looks like practically in just a little bit. But I, I know earlier I alluded to what has really, for me, been the, um, I guess, the biggest concern in these conversations, which is the language that we're using. I mean, I've, I've seen people, white people who have, I, I'm, I can, well, I'm going to assume, <laughs> speaking of assumptions, uh, yeah. that, that the intentions were good, but what they're saying comes off poorly or can even be offensive just because of ignorance, right? And, and there's criticism, you know, whether it was the timing of the post or the words being used or whatever it might be, or even, you know, what was in the image. I guess for those who at least have good intentions, whose whose heart is good, they want to make genuine change and show ongoing support and encourage ongoing efforts at equality, not just inclusion, but equality. What what are words that, that should be used and what are words that should not be used? Well, this one is a, a little bit of a, a harder question to answer. Okay. Uh, but just know that it is going to be uncomfortable. Um, so understand that I can't tell you exactly what words to say, but if you're worried about making mistakes and you're, you're worried about the wrong things, you know, the mistakes have already been made. What matters is that you understand that the BIPOC community is hurting and has been hurting for hundreds of years. Mm. What matters is that you truly care about our representation. That's what really matters. Hmm. That you truly care about acknowledging your white privilege and using it to magnify and elevate voices of color. You know, what matters is that you be the change in your circle. Use your platform to speak with empathy, compassion, and, you know, just be willing to learn that things need to be corrected. Yeah, yeah. And, and be willing to be corrected in case you do make those mistakes you know what i mean and so so the wording you know you can you can switch up the words you know any which way as long you know people can sniff out that bullshit and and, and as long as your heart is in the right place and and that you know and and that you are um behind what is visible mm. on your feed that you are actually doing the work social political work um whether it's donating or reading books or just um supporting you know black and brown business whatever it is you know as long as you know that um you truly do care and and kind of just have that mindfulness practice that's that's what matters and that you're willing to to learn and be corrected like Devonta was saying well, and, and I guess a lot of it does come back to action, right? I mean, I, I ask about the words because, uh, again, I think well-intentioned people, likely including myself, have said certain things or used certain phrases, meant well, but it came off poorly, or maybe it was just misguided, again, because of ignorance, not because of a, a poor heart. Um, but ultimately, and, and your point is well taken, action speaks much louder than words, Absolutely. and and we need to actually do something, not just say something and, and not just simply do something once or twice because it's, you know, point of conversation right now, but that we're making those efforts on an ongoing basis. I think that's, that's just a really great reminder. I appreciate your perspective on that. Um, one of the things you talked about in the, the honey book article, uh, which is really important, a a really great reminder for all of us is the significance of diversifying styled shoots. And it's funny because when you, when you, when I think about it and I think of the styled shoots I've seen on blogs or magazines or otherwise, I, overwhelmingly white for sure. What what should the conversation, uh, speaking of words being used, what should the conversation when a white person is talking to someone of color and they're wanting to photograph them for the sake of diversification and inclusion, um, what can that, what 
how should that conversation go down in a way that's not offensive to that person so that they, they don't feel tokenized, as you pointed out? What, what would that, how would that go? I think it begins um, before even making the proposition to include them in the styled shoot. I think it begins with something as simple and as free as supporting, uh, for example, if it's like a model uh, whose um, profession it is, you know, I I would say giving them a follow, (laughs) being genuine, interacting with them, speaking to them the same way you would speak to other people. You know, it's kind of mind, you know, baffling to us sometimes um, when we've heard people say that they don't know exactly how to speak to a BIPOC uh, person without offending. And honestly, the best thing I could say in regards to that is to just be real and, and, and be kind and be excited and use exciting, uplifting words and, uh, you know, support from the beginning before you even put that offer out there, you know, to include them or ask them if they want to be a part of a shoot. Um, you know, it, it's kind of up to you if you say specifically that you want to use them for the sake of diversifying your feed. I think that might be a little tricky, but just showing your excitement about getting to possibly work with um, with them, you know, complimenting them, making them feel good. And, um, you know, like we said, we you have to truly care about the way that black and brown folks are represented. And if you're doing it for the outward appearance, um, like I said, people will smell that on you from a mile away Mm. you have to you know go beyond what's visible um and don't just stop at finding a black model for your shoot you know round up a team of badass bipoc vendors to showcase their best work and support them by diversifying your vendor referral list you know um it's more than the words you use you have to be uh you know you have to truly care about our representation um because we've been painted in the media as criminals and thugs for far too long and you know just be mindful and and understand and have that um intention that black and brown love um matters too and and focus on that and i feel like the words will follow as long as you make it very heartfelt and 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 genuine and exciting and happy and you know it doesn't have to be so um thick with like uh, seriousness all the time, you know, humor, um, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? It's breaking the ice and, and complimenting, yeah. you know, liking their stuff. It's, it, it's tiny shit like that. That goes a really long way uh, mm. because that, that way they feel like a person, you know, they, they feel it, it's all about restoring the humanity, you know, um, and, and making them feel like they're seen and like, Oh shit, somebody's noticing me. Oh, that's awesome. Like, you, Oh wow. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it goes, it's little things like that, that make them feel, um, noticed you know everyone loves you know attention um you know it's a it's a human thing we know we want to feel beautiful we want to feel um desirable in a way that sounds kind of weird but just kind of having that same yeah just just having that mentality that that uh verbiage i guess you know to to be exciting and and be genuine and happy and you know stuff like that so i hope that kind of clarified a little bit all right again i appreciate your your perspective and shedding some light on um, a, a topic which, you know, it's, yeah, it's uncomfortable, I guess, in some cases. But again, I, I think the uncomfort in you describing these situations where um, a white person is trying to talk to to someone of color and, and they're, they're acting funny just to begin with. I, I think a lot of that just simply is, is nervousness, not nervousness because they're scared of the person, but nervousness because they want to make sure in light of especially all these conversations happening as of late, that what they're saying doesn't come off poorly. I, I, but I think to your point, it, it seems like there needs to be less focus on that and just simply being a human being talking to another human being, like chill the fuck out. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Excuse Absolutely. my language for all my, my regular listeners. I don't, I don't normally <laughs> speak that way, but um, I mean, that's, that's the first thing that came to mind because it really is so easy to, uh, um, I guess just to get uptight in the moment because we're yeah. overthinking it. Mm-hmm. Rather than just simply hanging out with somebody, it's, it just really doesn't have to be that that big of a deal. By the way, you mentioned an acronym a couple of times, uh, BIPOC, which for everybody listening in is Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Um, just briefly, will you shed some light on that acronym? Because I know it's not one that's popped up um, as of late, or it hasn't begun to be as popular until recently. Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's kind of interesting how words and, and uh, verbiage kind of develop um, over the years and how some things that were okay before um, kind of, they kind of evolve into something that's, you know, it kind of, I guess, includes people in a, in a better way. So before like a colored person, you know, that's, that term has been kind of canceled. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, if you have um, black indigenous 
people of color, those, it, it tends to actually identify the marginalized communities right. that kind of get lumped together into just a person of color, if or that a makes minority sense. Or, uh, yeah, exactly. Or a minority. It's more uplifting and more identifying of, you know, the actual identities of these people. So I, that's my take on it. It's kind of interesting to always, you know, see the trends and the, well, maybe not trends, but just the, the way that words and, and, and phrases kind of evolve. For sure. So, um, so yeah, I feel like that's a very, um, inclusive way to, um, describe and, and point out um people from often uh mar- marginalized communities so so yeah yeah wonderful and again i appreciate you shedding light and perspective on on that as well the last question for you and this is a you know honestly this is one that's not i don't think discussed enough in our in our industry and that is um <laughs> very simply how poorly white people are editing photos of brown and black skin um and and this is this is a conversation I, we actually had not too long ago with my friend Ty Pentecost on episode 362, um, and she did a live demonstration and spoke to the issue. But I'd, I'd love to get your take on how white photographers can do a better job of editing. Um, and maybe what are some of the common themes, common issues that you see, uh, and how can those be corrected? Well, uh, absolutely. So uh, we actually just posted an IGTV video full of education of the matter. It took several several weeks to put together and it's actually an hour long so it's definitely a labor of love uh we recommend you go check it out we posted it what two days ago yeah about two days ago Mm -hmm. and um yeah it's very very educational uh but right off the bat uh it's important to understand that a lot of the presets that are made are made with fair skin people in mind. Yeah. So they're really heavy on contrast, you know, lots of oversaturation of the reds and oranges, but, um, you know, melanated skin really doesn't need all that extra, you know, color. 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 <laughs> so yeah. It's important for you to learn how to use your HSL sliders, yes. to, you know, know how to tweak the presets you're using. Uh, and also other than that, you know, just basic uh, mindfulness, of uh, practices like avoiding whitewashing and uh, brightening skin. There's this thing in our industry uh, that would take a whole nother segment to talk about, but it's colorism. And it's, we have a tendency of thinking that lighter skin is prettier than darker skin. Mm. So you want to make sure that you're not doing that, but there's also the opposite where fairer skin, mostly white, people have a problem doing this but the presets make their skin look really really brown or really really tan Hmm. and you know it's not your natural complexion and you have to really really worry about uh blackface you don't want to (laughs) to be accused of that sadly they kind of like over overdo it with the tan a little bit kind of go overboard and so it just kind of a little funny like "Mm, what are you doing you know you're not that toasty in real life (laughs) (laughs) um but what, another thing that we covered in the video was like things that tend to uh, kind of come up um, with presets across the board and just like a, the, the general tone of um, black and brown folks is like, um, you know, there's like yellowing of the eyes, um, dull skin. So the way that like a darker skin kind of catches the light sometimes makes them look a little bit ashy and, and things. There are ways to counteract that with your tools in Lightroom to kind of restore that glow and make your black and brown clients, you know, basically radiate and glow the same way and and be as beautiful as you make, you know, your white clients look, you know, it's, it's just other things to be mindful of um, that. Like I said, we, we don't, you know, people don't tend to think about very often because unfortunately kind of, you know, white skin is the norm, white, whiter beauty, uh, you know, so it just, it's things to consider from uh, something that may not have been your, like an issue of your own you know when you're editing uh white folks so i'm going off on a tangent but it's just you know just thinking about um how to portray people in the best way possible you know melanated folks so make them glow make them glow yeah (laughs) well and you know what somehow i'm I'm following you all on instagram but somehow i missed the fact that you had posted this video i'm seeing it right here in the feed um it's it's entitled editing melanated skin and we'll make sure to should we link to that or just embed it in the show notes what's best for you all um, either way works, you know, I, I just would, I, however, the information kind of comes to you or to, you know, your listeners and everything, yeah. whether 
it's the video with uh, Ty Pentecost that we actually want to check out as well. Um, or however it is that the information gets into your hands, like um, that's what matters as long as you're willing to learn and consider other uh, perspectives and insights and things that you may not have ever really thought about before. Like we had a, a photographer um, reach out to us and tell us that um, she has been to a ton of like uh, workshops and like, you know, done a lot of courses for editing, for, you know, shooting um, couples and everything. And something that she never noticed that they never talked about was how to specifically cater to and take care of and edit um, darker skin. And mm. so it's just something that just tends to go unheard, kind of yep. flies under the radar. So however is best for you to kind of put that in there, um, we're okay with either way. And we just would appreciate people just listening with an open heart and, and, and you know, willing to – their willingness to, to do better, you know? so Absolutely. 100%. And I think really you summed it up beautifully here at the end of our conversation, the significance of openness. You know, we talked about – setting aside assumption, presumption, projection, um, keeping an open mind and open heart. And I, I, I think that's just a really important concept that we need to actually not just grasp internally, but actually live externally. And to that point, I just really appreciate both of you all coming on the show today, lending your perspective. Um, and of course, doing so through the article, we'll link to that in the show notes, the HoneyBook article at bocapodcast.com. Uh, as well as these videos that we've mentioned. Uh, this has been really wonderful, guys. Thank you so much for making time for the Book of Podcast today. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. We're so happy that we got to come in and, and, and share you know, our hearts with you. And we are so thankful and grateful that you were able to um, to give us the space to kind of you know, talk about these things that are, like we said, are really important. And we have to make sure that it doesn't just end up as another trend. Uh, it's, so. it's it's truly my privilege. We'll make sure to, of course, link to your website and Instagram in the show notes for everybody listening in. It is spiritofrevelry.com and Spirit of Revelry, uh, Revelry, excuse me, on Instagram. And of course, we'll link to the resources from today, uh, the talking points as well in the show notes, bocapodcast.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, photographers, for listening to the Boca Podcast. Will you let us know what you thought of the show by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple Podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is Nathan at bocapodcast.com. We do try to bring this show to you commercial free, so make sure to check out our sponsors, photographersedit.com and milu, M-I-I-L-U.com. Photographer's Edit is custom photo editing for the professional photographer, and Milu is the simplest way to create and manage timelines and shot lists for the events you're photographing.